79 of the notes. This is the prophetic chain, part 12, Revelation 18. We've been identifying the 3-1 combination in prophetic history as the link um, that is in the chain of prophecy that begins in Eden and goes to the end of the world, the second coming of Christ. In the Millerite history, the three angels' messages arrived in history, and at the end of the world, the fourth angel's message come. This is the three angels' message. This particular presentation is dealing with that link, our history, the history of Adventism, history of Adventism being the beginning with the Millerites, the end with the 144,000. This is the link in the chain that all the previous links have pointed forward to. We've been taking the fourth way mark in each of the links and bringing them into application for the end of the world and uh, they all take place in Revelation 18. The final fourth way mark in, in the, all, the, almost the final link of the chain. The final link of the chain being the second coming of Christ. But I want to start here on page 79 with a quote from Manuscript Releases, volume 16, page 270. Um, in many ways, this particular study is going to be a review for those of us in this room that have been students of prophecy in this message for very long. Um, but I trust that it will be a good review. Many who heard the first and second angels' messages thought they would live to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. Did the Millerites live to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven? Amen. Amen. If you ask that to most Adventism, they'd say, no. But he came to the cloud, came with the clouds before the Ancient of Days in fulfillment of Daniel 7.13 on October 22nd, 1844, thus typifying our history. Many who heard the first and second angels' messages thought they would live to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. Had all who claimed to believe the truth acted their part as wise virgins. Now notice she just, as she often does, combined the parable of the ten virgins with the messages of Revelation 14. She, knows, she understands those are the same prophecy. Had all who claimed to believe the truth acted their part as wise virgins, the messages, message would air this have been proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, but five were wise and five were foolish. The truth should have been proclaimed by the ten virgins, but only five had made the provision essential to join that company who walked in the light that had come to them. The third angel's message was needed. This proclamation was to be made. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the, first, under the messages of the first and second angels refused the third angel's message, the last message, to be given to the world. The last testing message. Almost left out the part that I wanted to emphasize. These messages are testing messages. And the third test that many of the Millerites failed was October 22, 1844. A similar work, now she's already compared the parable of the ten virgins and Millerite history and the messages of Revelation 14 as one and the same, but now she's going to add in the line of Revelation 18. A similar work will be accomplished when that other angel, represented in Revelation 18, gives his message. The first, second, and third angel's messages will need to be repeated. Now she's telling us that the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 need to be understood as repeating in Revelation 18, and as they do so, they will be a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. And from that point of reference, many truths can be derived. Now, speaking of Revelation 18, she says, Take each verse of this chapter and read it carefully, especially the last two. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of a bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by their sorceries were all nations Deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, in the context of speaking about Revelation 14, the parable of the ten virgins in Revelation 18, and Millerite history, and saying that all of these truths parallel one another in this passage. I mean, how many different things, how many different truths, characteristics, or waymarks are there in Revelation 14, Millerite history, parable of the ten virgins in Revelation 18? There are many. Okay, But as she puts these things all together, what is she emphasizing? She's saying, a time will come when the door will be shut. 
Last paragraph, the parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself. And every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. So she's, she's just referenced our need of understanding every verse of Revelation 18, study it carefully, study it in the context of Revelation 14 and the parable of the ten virgins in Millerite history. And then she says, especially study the last two, which we've already dealt, I've dealt with once, and I've heard two other speakers deal with it, that this phraseology from Jeremiah about the light of a candle shall no more be seen in thee, in the voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom, this is a term, a, a phrase that represents the close of probation. She says, study every, each verse of Revelation 18 carefully, but especially the last two. And when you get down to the last four verses of Revelation 18, you see that it's biblical terminology of the close of probation, of when Michael stands up. It's not the terminology of the Sunday law, where probation closes on Adventism. It's biblical terminology of when Michael stands up. So if we're to study Revelation 18 carefully, one of the things we do when we do that is we find the, first, last, the last four verses of Revelation 18 is identifying when human probation closes. Okay? Now, this phrase, we've, I've seen two other speakers and myself mentioned previously, you have on the bottom of your notes, Jeremiah 25, 9 and 10. Not going to read it. No one has enough time up here. It's already been established upon the testimony of two or three. <laughs> All right. <laughs> If you want a second witness for that in your notes, on the top of page 80, you have Jeremiah 7, 32 to 34 that uses the same expression that is identifying the close of probation. Then if you go to Revelation 18, 20 through 24, which is the last four verses, you'll see that in verse 20 we have a description that has also been dealt with at least twice and I admit I've mit missed some meetings here this week so maybe it's been dealt with more than twice but I've heard it from the other speakers at least twice in here where the little book is taken it's attached to a rock Jamal dealt with it just the last presentation yes. and it's thrown into the Euphrates and what's that marking? The Ba fall of Babylon, the close of probation. Okay, so you have the last four verses of Revelation 18 there under a millstone, and then you have Jeremiah 51, where Jamal referenced, showing you that the last four verses of Revelation 18 is identifying the close of human probation. Therefore, the verses prior to verse 20 of Revelation 18 are verses that are describing events in Earth's history that takes place prior to the close of human probation. Follow the logic? Okay, and you can see human probation represented as closing in Daniel 12.1 in your notes and then in Revelation 22.11. Next page. By the way, I already told you this is going to be a lot of review. It's already been presented here um, more than once Par from Great Controversy 393 that the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. You have that quote on your paper. And underneath it, you have the quote, which I've already read once, I think others have. The parable of the ten virgins has been, will be fulfilled to the very letter. Millerite history was the fulfillment of the parable of ten virgins. The parable of ten virgins is fulfilled again in our history here at the end of the world. So, Millerite history at a, a simple level, and of course we're going to put a line underneath it for our history as well. Um, this is August 11, 1840, when the angel of Revelation 10 comes down out of heaven with the two pillars of brass to place upon the sea and the land with the little book open in his hand and thus empowers the first angel's message. Um, first angel's message has been going through history to this point. Here it's empowered. And in June of 1842, the Protestant churches closed their doors against this message. And there are two doors that close in this history. According to William Miller, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to deal with this, I'm just going to see how many of us understand this. 
How does Miller, William Miller record? What, what historical event does William Miller record that identifies why the Protestant churches closed their door in June of 1842? This chart was introduced in May of 1842, and William Miller says the effect of the introduction of that chart caused the Protestant churches to label the movement as fanaticism and delusion. And the, at this point, the churches began to close their doors. It's a little bit solemn when you think about the period of time from May to June. Okay. <laughs> One month, this chart comes in, the doors begin to close. All right. In your notes, you have this under two closed doors. In June of 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures at the Casco Street Church in Portland. I felt it a great privilege to attend these lectures, for I'd fallen under discouragement and did not feel prepared to meet my Savior. The second course created much more excitement in the city than the first. With few exceptions, the different denominations closed the doors of their churches against Mr. Miller. Okay, But there's another door that closes down here. October 22nd, 1844. This is basic review, right? First angel's message arrives back here, 1798, correct? Increase of knowledge, message formalized. Why does the message have to be formalized by William Miller? Because it's going to test this generation. So it has to be put into an understandable package so that the Lord can hold this generation accountable for rejecting the message. If it can't be easily understood, then the Lord would be unjust for holding, holding that generation accountable. So he raises up William Miller. Miller meaning someone that separates the chaff from the wheat. And he separates the chaff from, chaff from the wheat in order to hold this generation accountable to the first angel's message and when the year day principle is confirmed. And when was the year day principle confirmed? Oh, no, 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 yeah, that's when, but what's another when was it confirmed? When Islam was restrained. When Islam was restrained, the year day principle was confirmed. And the mighty angel came down. The first angel's message was empowered. It began to test the Protestant churches. The testing process was underway. How do we know the testing process was underway? Because when the divine symbol comes down, there is a testing message marked in inspiration. When, when the dove came down on Jesus, he was tempted of the devil. All right? a testing message marked here. Testing message, God's people eat the little book, meaning it's time to carry the message to this generation. Then the introduction of the chart. What's the chart represent? The foundations. Foundations are always noted in this part of a reform movement, correct? It's in the history of the first decree that the foundation of the temple was laid. John the Baptist set forth the foundational message of his time. In this history, in the reform movement of Moses, and his message was, God is going to take his people out to worship him, and the foundation of that message was the Sabbath. And when Moses returns, to Egypt, the first thing he introduces is the Sabbath, which is the foundational message of his history. The foundation is always marked there. And the foundations are represented by this chart. So when the foundations are brought into this history, the door closes. All right? it's, it's interesting to note that when it comes to Habakkuk 2 and these two tables, all right, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it upon tables. And Sister White clearly says more than once that both of these charts were the fulfillment of Habakkuk 2. It's interesting to note many things. that it, This is where the Lord's entering into covenant with modern Israel. And of course, when he entered into covenant with ancient Israel, he gave them two tables. Okay, the two tables of the Ten Commandments are prefiguring these two tables. All right. Sister White says the truths on these charts represent the rock of ages. She says they represent the only foundation that a man can lay, which is Christ Jesus. Of course, the two Ten Commandments, they represent Christ too. 
And when it's time for ancient Israel to be divorced of God, those people that were fighting against the message of their hour, they proclaimed to be defending those two tables. The Pharisees were the defenders of the law, and they didn't know that the law was right in front of them. They crucified the law. So here we are at the end of ancient Israel, and the two tables that we've been given are right before Adventism, and they're telling us all the reasons that this isn't truth. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we forget what happened to ancient Israel. They did not know that in thinking that they were defending Christ, their Messiah, they were actually participating in his crucifixion. Um, but I forgot the point I was going to make, but it's all right. It wasn't part of the notes anyway. In 1888 materials, page 804, it says, that God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy. So this is the first angel's message in 1798. I'm going to mark it here because this is when the first angel's message is empowered. This is the arrival of the second angel's message. All the messages arrive in history. All the messages arrive in history, and thereafter they are empowered. Okay, It arrived here, was empowered here. The second angel's message arrived here, and then it's empowered here at the midnight cry. Right? When the Holy Spirit is poured out. And Sister White's clear that the midnight cry is the empowerment of the second angel's message. The midnight cry is just a, a component of the second angel's message. It's not, a, it's not a message that is distinct from the second angel's message. It's part of the second angel's message. And the second angel's message reaches its climax when the third angel's message arrives in history. And we know as Adventists that the third angel's message is not empowered till later on down the line of time when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins with it. So all the messages arrive in history and thereafter they are empowered. And the midnight cry, the climax of the second angel's message, it reaches its conclusion at judgment. Right? And of course, this is the three-step work of the Holy Spirit. convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and righteousness was manifested in this history right here. This confirmed that what William Miller was saying was believable. The year day principle made it believable, and he was saying, if you don't get ready, if you and I don't get ready, we're about to receive the mark of the beast. Is that what William Miller was saying? That's what he was saying. He wasn't using those words, but he was saying the same thing. And when it was empowered, the conviction of sin was settled into that message. And it began to test the churches till they closed their doors. Second angel's message arrived. At the midnight cry, righteousness was manifested in, an, in a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit that takes that message across the United States in two months. That concludes with judgment, followed by disappointment. Right? God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy, and their work is not to close till the and their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angels' message are still true for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. What follows the second angels' message? It says the first and second angels' messages are still truth for this time, and are to run parallel with that which follows. Which follows the first and second? Third angel's message. This is the history of the third angel's message. Every reform movement has a time at the end. Just so happens that with Adventism, Miller writes 144,000. With Adventism, the time at the end is marked in the same verse, Daniel 11:40. Okay, same verse, 1989, 70, 1798 marked. 1989, there is an increase of knowledge. The message is formalized, 1995. The students of prophecy in Adventism have come to understand that the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 is a fulfillment of verse 40, and thus the next verse, verse 41, is serious business because it's identifying a Sunday law in the United States, and Seventh-day Adventists at the Sunday law in the United States are going to demonstrate whether they have a character prepared for the mark of the beast or the seal of God, and suddenly there's a message in Earth's history that should, that should convict a human being of sin if he understood it correctly. 
But we've been hearing a lot here this week by the various speakers that seeing they don't see and hearing they don't hear. So they're not being convicted by this message. They're just sleeping on in their Laodicean condition. And part of the reason for that is that even though this history is perfectly paralleled by this history, this history is the history of Laodicea, and this is the history of Philadelphia. Okay? God's dealing with a different class of church. <laughs> Philadelphians, they're on fire for the word of God. Laodiceans, they're blind, but don't know that they're blind. So what we're saying is that on August 11th, 2001, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. And it brings all, it brings everything. All the prophecies of the Bible are pointing to this history. I mean, this is the last link in the chain, brothers and sisters. This is the last link in the chain. And as students of prophecy, this means we get to bring all the links right down here. I mean, once you get this established as a student, of pro as a, a teacher of prophecy, once you have it established for your students, then you can start bringing line after line after line upon it. When this angel comes down, he most definitely has a little book open in his hand. What's the little book? This is why it says the book is the, that portion of the prophecy of Daniel that related to the last days is what was unsealed here. The little book in his hand is the book of Daniel, but it's primarily the last six verses of Daniel 11. All right. Testing process begins here. Testing process begins here. And there have been some people here struggling. And I, won't, I you know, if you, if you hear a couple of people struggling or at least thinking out loud to you about certain things, that means there's probably other ones in the crowd. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you the truth. You may or may not believe it. And this is for anyone on the DVD. I'd love, I would love to go to any church in Adventism and share this message. I've done it. I've been in a church in Adventism at one time that I was setting up at the pulpit before it started and saying, I hope no one's recording this <laughs> because what was going up there on, on the stage was, was something that I really didn't want to be associated with, but it didn't matter. I sat through it. I shared the message. Okay. You were there. Um, and Alecki, where's Alecki? He's, he's not here, but he was there and Kathy was there. I would love to share this in every church in Adventism given opportunity. So to think, to think that I have some kind of dislike for my Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters is a misconception, okay? So the, the struggle that's been going on here is, you know, isn't there a way to share these things without being so direct, okay? So I, I, they, nothing to do with that. I heard that input, but I also heard something about the Elijah message that was rattling around in my mind. So I started thumbing through the Bible and I came across this quote under, under Malachi from Sister White, under the, the last promise of Malachi. If you uh, have a study Bible, it's the last, it's not in your notes, it's not in your notes. It's in the study Bible. You go to the, la the last verse of Malachi and the last reference from the spirit of prophecy on Malachi says this, it's from Southern Watchman, March 21st, 1905. Our message must be as direct as was that of John. He rebuked kings for their iniquity. Notwithstanding the peril his life was in, he never allowed truth to languish on his lips. Our work in this age must be as faithfully done. In this time of well-nigh universal apostasy, God calls upon his messengers to proclaim his law in the spirit and power of Elias. As John the Baptist, in preparing a people for Christ's first advent, advent, called their attention to the Ten Commandments, so we are to give, with no uncertain sound, the message, Fear God and give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment is come, with the earnestness that characterized Elijah the prophet and John the Baptist, we are to strive to prepare the way for Christ's second advent. Amen. Now, here... <coughs> The, the line of the tribe of Judah, he opens up stuff. For many years, I've been teaching something that I still believe is true, but I understand something different now. I used to, when I get to the point where I says, this is Philadelphia and this is Laodicea, then I'd say the Philadelphians, 
gave the first angel's message. We give the third angel's message. They, open, they announce the opening of the judgment. We announce the close of the judgment. I understand it a little bit different now. Okay, they announce the opening of the judgment of the dead. And we announce the opening of the judgment of the living. All right, so we, the, the, the actual three angels message that we're involved with, it's, it's getting clearer and more direct. And my question still, how, how do we soften down the message where we're not offensive and tell our brothers and sisters that we're now in the judgment of the living and if you don't wake up and take this message seriously and learn it, you're going to die in the very near future. How do we tone that down? How do we do it? The animals are getting on the ark. Sister White, there's one quote, and I don't have it on the top of my head. She says, the Laodicean message is a most startling message. What's it mean to startle? It means to, it means to like, it's like when Kathy and I were first together way back many moons ago. We're dead asleep, and I'm living with my best friend. And he comes in, and he kicks my door in in the middle of the night, says, the house is on fire. Get out of the house. And I ran into the front room, and it was really on fire. And all I could do was run back in the room and break the window out and get her and I out of there before the house went up in flames. He had to startle me awake. Okay, he, he needed to awaken me rapidly, or I was going to die. And I mean it was a matter of a couple minutes, or we were gone. All right. It was a very old wooden house in the deserts of California, and there was a typical 40-mile-an-hour desert wind blowing. So when the wind hit the fire, it went up in minutes. So that was less serious than the judgment of the living. We have to have a startling message. If you can figure out how to, how to soften it up and still do the work, you let me know. Okay? But I, I digress. All right? So if you go to page 82, speaking of Revelation 18, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. What is that? That's Revelation 18, 1, right? Well, that's August 11th, 1840. Is it not? All right. Verse 2 and 3 says this, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul and spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Brothers and sisters, this has to take place, these two verses, before verse 4. Verse 4, this message that we just read, this is this history. Okay. The fall of Babylon arrives in 1842. This is the history down here. This history down here has got to repeat this, because verse 4 of Revelation 18 is the Sunday law. All right. Verse 4 of Revelation 18 is the Sunday law. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. That's October 22nd, 1844. This is where the door closes. The door closes on Adventism at the Sunday Law. Now, I have a series of quotes here for those of you that are unsure about this. And brothers and sisters, what does Sister White say about Revelation 18? Where do we start? Every verse of this chapter is to be carefully studied. And I'm, tell I'm telling you from my, my understanding, my conviction, if you don't get it straight in your head that verse 4 of Revelation 18 is the Sunday Law, then it's always going to be squishy when you're dealing with Revelation 18 and you can't afford to not be clear about Revelation 18. All right? Verse 4 is the Sunday law. Let's look at some reasons why. She's emphasized that time will come when the door will be shut. You see that from manuscript releases under the shut door. So let's consider when our door shuts, the Seventh-day Adventist. Testimonies, Volume 9, page 97. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. We're living in the time of our visitation. Brothers and sisters, this here, from here to here, from here to here, is the time of the Millerites' visitation. 
When was the time of the Jews' visitation? When he was baptized. He came to confirm the covenant with many for one week. That was the time of their visitation, and they, they crucified him. Why? Because they knew not the time of their visitation. This is the time of the Millerite visitation, beginning when the angel comes down. Our, the time of our visitation begins when the angel comes down, when Christ is baptized. All right? We're living in the time of our visitation. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is the time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the look, Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Door closes at the Sunday Law in the United States. This is the activity of the USA in both cases. Protestants of the USA. The door closes at the Sunday Law. And what happens at the Sunday Law? Notice the bar that Review and Herald, December 18th, 1888. Just the last sentence, just trying to make some points here. First sentence first. A time, of coming, a time is coming when the law of God is, in a special sense, to be made void in our land. This is Sunday law, right? In our land. This isn't the world Sunday law. This is Sunday law in the United States. The last sentence says, just the last Law of God will to all intents purposes be made void in our land and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. At the Sunday law, national ruin right here, right? You see it? His hand is stretched out to save during the time period of God's destructive judgment while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Okay? Somebody has to enter before the Sunday law. Who's that? That's Seventh-day Adventists. They have to enter during the time of their visitation. Okay, a couple more points on this. Next page. Review and Herald, June 15, 1897. Protestants will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the state. This national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. So we're still talking about the same thing, right? Right? <coughs> The protest of the Bible truth will no longer be tolerated by those who have, made, have not made the law of God their rule of life. Then will the voice be heard from the graves of the martyrs, represented by the souls that John saw slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, which they held. She's placing the fifth seal at Revelation 18.4. That's a different study. Okay. Then will the voice be heard from the graves of the martyrs. Then the prayer will ascend from every true child of God. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void their law, thy law. When the law is made void, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. Okay, so we have that in our mindset. Review and Herald, August 14, 1900. Through successive generations, iniquity has increased. We, increased. we are nearing the time when God will say, the cup of their iniquity is full. In David's day, the contempt placed upon the law of God led him to explain, exclaim, it is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they've made void thy law. When they make void the law, their cup of iniquity is full. Whose cup? United States. The United States. Okay, United States. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. You've seen all this happen right here, right? Now, Signs of the Times, November 8th, 1899. None are condemned until they've had light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. Everyone in this room going to be held accountable for the light of the Sabbath? Yes. Absolutely. Even if you don't know it. If, if you've joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church in membership and somehow not been instructed or not cared to learn on your own volition the truth between Sabbath and Sunday, you're going to be held accountable for it anyway. Because you're not judged by the light you have, your light you, your light you have and the light you could have had if you would have availed yourself. And there's no excuse to be a Seventh-day Adventist and not know that truth. None are condemned until they have had the light and have seen the obligation of the Fourth Commandment. But when the decree shall go forth, enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast in his image, 
the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Who's receiving the mark of the beast there? Seventh-day Adventists. Because the people outside of Adventism are not held accountable to that light at that point in time, are they? Because it's at the Sunday law that the people that receive the seal of God according to Bible prophecy are lifted up as an ensign. And once they're lifted up, then all the world sees them and comes, those that want to respond, come to Zion and stand with them. Okay, Maranatha 173. This is where it gets a little bit trickier. Revelation 18 points to a time when, as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the world will have fully reached the condition for... You sure? Are you sure that's what she said there? Revelation 18 points to the time when, as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the church will have finally reached the condition foretold by the second angel, and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. <coughs> this message is the last that will ever be given to the world, and it will accomplish its work. Now she's going to give us some context about when this takes place. She says, when those that believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2.12, shall be left to receive strong delusion and believe a lie, then the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call, come out of her, my people. Amen. So right here before the Sunday law, right here, Adventism is receiving strong delusion. Right? Why? Because, 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 because Revelation 18 points to a time when as the result of rejecting the threefold warning in this history, there is a threefold warning for Adventism. Because the history of the Millerites is going to be repeated. Now this gets hard. This gets sticky for, for you if you don't lock certain things in. And what makes it hard, challenging, purposeful, by the line of the tribe of Judah. He, he did this on purpose. To see this correctly, you have to study a little bit. All right? You don't just get this truth from hearing it from your neighbor. Here, in this history, there are two temple cleansings. All right? Just like in the history of Christ. And the way Christ cleanses the temple every time, does, does Jesus ever change? No. The way he cleanses the temple is divinity flashes through humanity. That's what Sister White says happened in the two temple cleansings when he was here on earth with us. And on August 11th, 1840, there was a mighty angel that came down out of heaven. And Sister White says it's no less a personage than Jesus Christ. And divinity flashed through humanity. And when the door, Protestants closed the door, the first temple cleansing was finished. Here, when the Holy Spirit's poured out, divinity flashed through humanity, and the second temple cleansing closed when October 22, 1844 arrived, and the other door closed. What makes it tricky is that here, those outside, the Protestants outside the Millerites, were judged first. But here, judgment begins in the house of God. So with this reversal of the temple cleansings, it's sometimes hard to grapple with Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3. You know the door closes on Adventism at the Sunday Law, and the Sunday Law is verse 4. And it's easy to see that this is the first angel's message in our history, because the first angel's message up here, it's empowered when the divine symbol comes down. So the divine symbol comes down in Revelation 18, verse 1. Mighty angel comes down out of heaven, and the earth is lightened with his glory. That's got to be here. This marks the beginning of the temple cleansing. But is there a three-step three-step testing process that climaxes at the Sunday Law for Adventism before or at verse 4. Yeah, there is. There is. But it's hard. It's hard to see that, that three-step testing process because of the terminology that's used in Revelation 18, verses 1, 2, and 3. Okay? Um, go to page 84. We're going to try to deal with some of that terminology after we put one or two more things in place. Okay, 
One who sees beneath the surface, who reads the hearts of all men, says, of those who have had great light. One, Christ, reads the heart of Seventh-day Adventists. Is that a fair paraphrase? Okay. They are, not, they are not afflicted and astonished because of their moral and spiritual condition. Yea, they've chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions. When do, when do their delusions come? Just before the Sunday law. The Lord says, I'm going to choose their de delusions. And I will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, because they rejected, received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, Jesus... He's, his writings are so divine, okay? They're so divine. You can't, you, I'm sorry if it causes people to stumble, all right? But if you, if you realize where we started here, that the angel Gabriel, according to Sister White, gave William Miller the commencement of the chain of prophetic truth, and William Miller says the commencement I was given was 457, 508, and 677. The daily, the 2300, the scattering and gathering. That's what was given to William Miller. Now, I'm I haven't got time to go into it, but brothers and sisters, when you, when you think that through, William Miller can't understand the scattering. He can't understand that the scattering represents the trampling down of God's people and God's sanctuary by paganism and papalism until he knows what paganism is. You have to understand what paganism is first. So the first place in reality, and, 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 and there's no, no question about the 2300 days, William Miller is clear. He first found the 2520 and then the 2300 years. So all we're talking about is did William Miller find the 2520 first or did he find the daily first? Okay. If you're going to understand the 2520, you have to understand the daily. So the first thing that the angel Gabriel leads the Chosen One. Is it okay if I call William Miller the Chosen One? Because that's what Sister White called him. The first place Angel Gabriel leads him to is the daily. And where he comes to understand it is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That is the subject of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And here we're talking about the delusion that comes on Adventism at the end of the world. And that delusion is based upon not having the love of the truth of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and the people try to tell me that the daily should not be a testing question. Well, brothers and sisters, the daily here, it's on these charts. These charts are the old paths. And according to Jeremiah, when the time comes to return to the old paths, there's going to be an argument. We will not walk therein. We will not hearken to the sound of the trumpet. Everything on these charts is a testing question. What part of these truths can you reject with safety? So, so I'm sorry. The fact that the Second Thessalonians is promising the delusion for the end of Adventism and the very beginning of Adventism is based upon the truth of the daily that's identified by William Miller in Second Thessalonians. I just have a hard time separating that. Okay. The heavenly teacher inquired, What stronger delusion can beguile the mind than the pretense that you're building upon the right foundation and that God accepts your works when in reality you're working out many things according to worldly policy and sinning against Jehovah? Oh, it is a great deception, a fascinating delusion that takes possessions of mind when men who have once known the truth mistake the form of godliness for the spirit and power thereof, when they suppose that they are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, when in reality they are in need of everything. Last paragraph. Who can truthfully say our gold is tried in the fire, our garments unspotted by the world? I saw our instructor pointing to the garments of so-called righteousness, stripping them off. He laid bare the, the defilement beneath. Then he said unto me, cannot you see how they have pretentiously covered up their defilement and rottenness of character? How is the faithful city? Who's the faithful city? Jerusalem. Who's Jerusalem at the end of the world? Seventh-day Adventist church. How has the Seventh-day Adventist church... Now this is in my words become a harlot. My father's house is made a house of merchandise, a place where the divine presence and glory have departed. Now what happens when his father's house becomes a place of merchandise? 
he cleanses the temple. Okay? He, he cleanses, that's what happened in the time of Christ. That's what happened here. Go to Jeremiah 7. It's not in your notes. Jeremiah 7. This is where, this is where now, now you were at the point where we can almost start pulling the triggers on some of these, these links in the chain. But, of course, we're almost out of time. So, so relax. Verse 4 of, Revel of uh, Jeremiah 7. If you're there. Yeah. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Now, one of the brothers read here, where Sister White commented on this, and she says, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we. All right. Okay. But read on. When's this, when's this fulfilled? Students of prophecy, when's this fulfilled, first off? This is the third angel's message, repeated three times. Okay. Of course, Sister White only repeats it twice because she wants, to, wants us to understand that it's something that takes place in the second and the fourth angel's message. <laughs> All right. But maybe that's... Anyway, verse 5. For if we thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbors, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. What, what lying words do you trust in? The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Will you still murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not? And come and stand before me in this house, Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is called by my name, did the Lord choose that name? Yes. The, do you really think the Lord chose the name, the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yes. Really? Yes. Then, of course, we wouldn't ever, ever, ever think of copywriting it if it was the Lord's, right? Yes. We don't do that with the Bible, do we? We don't do it with the spirit of prophecy, do we? Whoa. What kind of blindness is that? To think that we can claim ownership over something that the Lord has specifically said is mine. Anyway, that's not what we're here for. And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. In, is this house, which is called by my name, become a den, a den of robbers? He's a, this is what kind of terminology? Cleansing the temple time, is it not? If this house become a den of robbers in your eyes, behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go you now unto my place which, is, which was in Shiloh. All the prophets are speaking at the end, about the end of the world, right? How in the world can you and I go to Shiloh? It says, go ye now to Shiloh. How can we go to Shiloh? Just look it up in the Bible, brothers and sisters. Shiloh is there in the Bible, and God's word liveth eternally. Shiloh's there. It's alive. And what's Shiloh? It's one of the links, isn't it not? What happened at Shiloh? Well, we had Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. And at Shiloh, there was a disappointment. And what was that disappointment? Ichabod. The glory is departed. So when Sister White, or when Jeremiah, not Sister White, when Jeremiah is saying the lie is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we, and then Jeremiah says, if you want to understand what that means, then go to Shiloh. What's it mean at Shiloh? What's it mean? It's been a long week, hasn't it? <laughs> what it means here at this prophecy school is it's time that Hophni and Phinehas and Eli get set aside and Samuel gets chosen. Doesn't it? That this is the point in time where the Lord takes the work, the reins, takes the reins into his own hands and cause, calls men and women from the common walks of life to finish. Isn't that what it means? When it reaches the point where the, where the house that's called by his name has become a den of thieves and robbers, you know that Christ is going to cleanse the temple and he is choosing Samuel. 
based upon God's prophetic word. Right? That's the prophetic chain. But go ye now unto my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. What did he do to it? Now, of course, like I said, we are working out of order. This Revelation 18 is supposed to be a couple more down the line. And by now, if we were working in sequence, um, Brother Jamal would have dealt with one other subject, but we're going to put it in place anyway. Ezekiel 21. You know, there's a place where Sister White takes this terminology from Jeremiah 7, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and she ties it in with Ezekiel 21. She ties them together. Okay, Ezekiel 21, starting in verse 25, says this. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. Who's the wicked profane prince? This is Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Right? His day came right here. Isn't he the wicked prince under discussion here? Zedekiah. What's his day? This is the chain. What's his day? It, and this is a 3-1 combination, isn't it? What's the fourth? This, in this length, who is it? Ah, that king of the north. Thou wicked prince, whose day has come. Who's Zedekiah? Who's Zedekiah? Let's read it. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel. Who's the prince of Israel at the end of the world? Seventh-day Adventist church, all right? Whose day is come. What day is it? We haven't got time for it. I'll just tell you what it is according to Isaiah. It's the day of the east wind. Right? It culminates in the Sunday law. Whose iniquity shall have an end. When does, when does the profane prince's iniquity have an end? When probation closes, but in the judgment of the living, it's all settled. It's either blotted out or it's left in there. It's all over. Judgment of the living. Thus saith the Lord, remove the diadem, take diadem take, and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is Samuel and abase Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. Do all the prophets tell the same story? Okay, this is another link. And Sister White ties Jeremiah 7 and this passage together. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn. When does this take place? When they're saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. You ever ran the expression overturn, overturn in the spirit of prophecy and seen how many times Sister White says the Lord is about to overturn, overturn, and overturn the institutions called by His name? When does that take place? It takes place when Nebuchadnezzar conquers Zedekiah and destroys Jerusalem. Right? Prophetic chain makes that crystal clear. Sunday law. The Sunday law. So, here's the door closing. We have three tests before here, right? And these are the hard ones. Let's look at them. Revelation 18. Okay. Now this is pretty, pretty easy for some of us that have been through this. Verse 1 is where the mighty angel comes down. Paralleling when the mighty angel comes down. When's the mighty angels in both histories come down? When Islam is restrained. And we got the historical evidence and everyone in the world knows it, that Islam was restrained on September 11th, 2001. Yes. Just like it was restrained on August 11th, 1840. Right? And we went through very quickly. 
The references in the spirit of prophecy, and there are others that identify that when the second voice of Revelation 18 in verse 4 says, come out of her, my people, that that's the Sunday law in the United States. And at the Sunday law in the United States, we already know in this room, probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists in the United States. The door closes. Our door closes here. Adventists' door closes here. Our testing message is empowered here. And we have a three-step testing process in here. And that three-step testing process is Revelation 18, verses 2 and 3. Verse 2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Wow. If you're actually going to say that verse 2 right here is pronounced upon Adventism before the church is purified at the Sunday law, then I'm certain you must be calling the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon. But it's not. And, and I've opposed that position for two primary reasons for almost 20 years. The first is, Sister White says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in Babylon and never will be. Amen. And no man will ever have a message that says it is. But we're supposed to do everything from the Bible, right? And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you call the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon, then you are distorting the prophetic record. <coughs> Babylon is the papacy. <coughs> Babylon is the threefold union of the beast, the dragon, the false prophet. And as bad as Babylon is, it's not in as worse condition as Laodicea. Because Laodicea has had the greatest light of all history and stands in disobedience to that light. So when you call Laodicea Babylon, not only are you confusing the prophetic symbols, you're giving Laodicea a compliment. You sorry? You are. It's not Babylon. So what is it that I'm saying that there is a, a, a test for Adventism marked in verse 2 that's Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Brothers and sisters, the prophetic word says the first time that Babylon fell is in the story of Nimrod. And the prophetic record is, is that Noah's sons and Noah gave a warning message to that generation. And then the Lord came down to look at the generation that was building the tower and there was a pronouncement made that now nothing will be restrained from them that their imagination would think to do. This is Nimrod and his, his companions. And the key word there is their imagination. Because what brought the flood was that man's imagination was wicked continually. So the, the Nimrod group reached the point where the Lord came down, it says, looked at the situation and made a pronouncement that was followed by a judgment. And the pronouncement was is that they were not going to change. They weren't going back. And he punished them. And what was his punishment for them? He scattered them. And the scattering is a type of the 2520. Is it not? Yeah. No, it isn't. Not if you're blind and you can't see the 2520. But if you can see it, then the scattering in the story of Nimrod represents the 2520. But that's only one testimony. We need at least two to establish something. Okay, so you have, you have Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 of Daniel, right? He's given a warning message from who? From Daniel. Don't miss that one. Where's our warning message come from? Daniel. Where's the Millerite warning message come from? Where'd Nebuchadnezzar get his warning message from? Did he disregard his warning message? Was there a pronouncement? Did a divine watcher come down and pronounce that he had crossed the boundaries of that warning message? Then what was his judgment? 2520. Okay, a warning message, a message rejected, divine pronouncement, judgment, 2520. That's the story of Nimrod. Second testimony, story of Belshazzar. Or Nimrod, third testimony, story of Belshazzar. Was Belshazzar given a warning message? Yes. From who? Yes. 
And when Daniel comes in to the party of Belshazzar, what's he remind him of? Though you knew all this, all what? All the history of his grandpa Nebuchadnezzar, right? In fact, Sister White says he was alive when that took place. He watched it. Okay, He knew it. So his warning message was what? The 2520. It was the story of Nebuchadnezzar, but sort of. But what we want to see is his warning message with the foundation. Hmm. Nebuchadnezzar's warning message is the foundation, and Belshazzar represents someone that rejects the foundational warning message. And so, a divine pronouncement comes. Many, many tekel yafarsin. Written on the wall. You ever seen many, many tekel yafarsin written on the wall? Yes. Have you? <laughs> Have you? It's a pronouncement. That is followed by what? Judgment. This here, verse 2. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's three witnesses against Adventism. Concerning what? That they're rejecting their foundational message. That they're acting like Belshazzar in relation to the warning message of Nebuchadnezzar. And when do you expect to see, when do you expect the pronouncement to arrive in history? When should it be? When, you, when can you mark it in history? When can you mark it in history? When the charts come back into history. It's the handwriting on the wall. It's, it's, it's the pronouncement. It's the warning. And it isn't an accident that the argument is the 2520. The 2520. The 2520, the 2520, the 2520. But we don't see it. We don't see it. It's blind. We're blind. Verse 2 is identifying the test over the foundations. This is the argument about returning to the old past. And it's simultaneously giving a pronouncement that those in Adventism that are rejecting these tests are following the course of Belshazzar. But what's verse 3? Verse 3 is... For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through her abundance of de her delicacies. Brothers and sisters, we, everyone in this room should understand that the kings of the earth do not come together with the papacy until after the Sunday law in the United States. Verse 3 here. Verse 3. It has to, the, the perfect fulfillment of verse 3 has to come after the Sunday law. Verse 3 is Daniel 11, 42. Okay, it's Revelation 13, 14. It's when the ten kings agree to give their kingdoms to, to the beast in Revelation 17. And it comes after the Sunday law. So what is this? There's one quote, one more quote I want to point you to in our notes. And I know I'm over time. It's on the top of page 86. It says, The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and that they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Not until this condition shall be reached, and the union of church and state with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout the Christendom, will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. The perfect fulfillment of the second angel's message is yet future. The second angel's message was fulfilled in the Millerite history. The second angel's message was typified with Jehoiachin. The second angel's message has been typified throughout the prophetic chain from the story of Adam all the way to the end of the world. It's been typified over and over again. And this here is not the perfect fulfillment. When's the perfect fulfillment of the third angel's message? It's this verse. Verses 1, 2, 3 of Revelation 18 is not the perfect fulfillment because it takes place in the first temple cleansing that leads to and climaxes at the Sunday law. So what is verse 3 talking about? It's talking about the image of the beast, the combination of church and state, and the three-step testing process for Adventism is a warning message convicting of sin. 
It's a big message. It has to do with the foundations of Adventism. It has to do with the spirit of prophecy. But our second test, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, it's not in your notes, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971, says this. One thing is certain. No, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test they must pass before they are sealed. There's a test that comes before we're sealed by which our eternal destiny will be decided that has to do with the image of the beast because the paragraph before that, she says, one thing is certain. The Lord has shown me clearly the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. This is the image of the beast test. This is the test of recognizing that church and state are coming together in the United States prior to the Sunday law. And this is the test where Adventism either finalizes their development of the image of the beast or the image of Christ in their own experience just prior to the Sunday law. These verses here are the cleansing of the temple for Adventism that lead to the Sunday law in verse 4 where the door closes. Do you see it? Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we wish to be part of the, the wonderful work of awakening and informing your people, but we understand that as Laodiceans ourselves, that we are a very difficult people to reach. And we certainly don't know how to do it with our human understanding. So we submit, we submit that work into your hands and ask that you can allow us to be molded as you would see fit, that you would provide the messages you've been doing as you would see fit, and give us correction if we are um, wrongly emphasizing or magnifying things that we, you would not want us to. But Lord, it seems like the house is on fire and there's but a short period of time to get out of the house or die. And it's, it's alarming to think that uh, part of our, our work is to figure out how to exactly awaken and bring these people out. We have to submit that into your hands and trust that though we may be making some mistakes that um, you're going to keep educating us if we continue to follow upon this path that you are leading us up to. And as long as we keep appreciating the light that's behind us of the midnight cry, we, ha we ask that you'd keep us on that path. Um, and give us the wisdom and the discernment to know when we need to take things off and throw them over the side that are holding us back for going, from going higher up on that path. We thank you for being with us so far throughout this prophecy school. Ask for your continued presence the rest of this day, the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen.